Let's just pray. The Lord Jesus said, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Lord, may your spirit and your word bring us life this morning. Amen. Today is the end of our double series. You may be dimly aware that ever since last September, we've been running two concurrent series. This is our God, about the character of God, and Come, Follow Me, about our everyday discipleship of Christ. And last week, Jonathan polished off the second series with his talk on the storm on the lake. Well, today I'm down to finish the first part of the series, which is The All-Sufficient God. And the title of this talk is Five Lies and One Single Reality. Five Lies and a Single Reality. Now, I've probably confessed this before, but Hester and I have reached the point where we need electric bikes. However, I found after a few weeks of uh, winter storm and rain that I would sometimes pedal and not get full power. Something was holding the bike back. It wasn't performing properly, so I took it to Riley's, our wonderful local bike shop, and I said, is it because I'm pedaling into the wind? Or is it because I need to pedal harder? And they said, no. You've got mud on the sensors. <laughs> oh, I can't get up. Anyway, behind that um, arrangement of the uh, pedal, I don't understand it at all, um, there are little contact points. And they receive power from the battery, which you can see going up the top there. And when one or two of these sensors get obscured, they don't receive power. And so they cleaned off the mud, free of charge, <laughs> and lo and behold, everything went smoothly, and I got out in front of all those slow motorists. Now, this is somewhat like our Christian experience, isn't it? We're traveling smoothly and happily, and then we lose power for some reason. Now, this could be because we've deliberately embarked on a course which we know to be wrong. That's sadly all too common. And the sooner we realize, confess to the Lord, and ask Him to help us to get back on track, the better. It's also true that our feelings of God's nearness fluctuate. What seems familiar on Sundays, the things of God, the language of the Bible, faith and all that, may become a bit remote on Monday morning and certainly by Friday. Our health, the weather, our bank balance, they all affect how we feel. But faith is independent of our feelings. It's worth saying that again and again. So we must expect attacks on our faith. If we're starting to think that the Christian life isn't working, there could be mud on our contact. We're being conned into believing some of the devil's lies. The devil is the arch mudslinger, and his best and oldest lie is this God isn't up to the job. God can't cope. You can't trust him to manage the job of running the universe. Things have gone so badly wrong that you need new management. So Paul 
in this great passage which ends Romans 8, exposes and deals with some of the classic lies. Huge dollops of mud, which if we start to believe them, will clog up our system, so we stop trusting God fully, and consequently ex experience a lack of power in our Christian life, a lack of desire to pray or soak in the Bible, a feeling that church has become routine or irrelevant, an anxiety about the future that may border on the neurotic, a coldness about heavenly things, and an obsession with the things of earth. We're still followers of Christ, but like Peter, we follow at a distance. The reason? Mud. Lies. Here are five of them. Lie number one. No sense in things. There's no sense in what's happening to you. It's all random. Life is unfair. God can't love you after all. Verse 28. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Okay, so you had a bad night. You said something to offend the people you live with or your neighbor next door. You burnt the toast. Your car won't start, and you're going to miss that appointment. And you lost your 100% record with Wordle. If you're such a favorite with God, why doesn't he arrange everything to suit you? Well, he could. And isn't it funny, actually, how that free parking space sometimes turns up? It happened for us yesterday. Last parking space. But it doesn't always. And this verse, anyway, isn't about getting free parking spaces or life being a perfect bed of roses. It's about God working everything together for our good, even the worst possible things that could happen and tragically do happen. God's chief concern is for our Christian character, for us to grow into the likeness of Christ himself. Stuff happens, yes, but the apparently random events of life are being woven together in an intricate but wonderfully and ultimately satisfying design by the all-sufficient God who has everything, everything under his control. We may not be able to make sense of stuff that happens, but God can, even if he doesn't show us at the time or later. And John Stott, writing on this verse, quotes the example of Joseph and his brothers. After their unfair treatment of Joseph and his imprisonment and then his rise to power in Egypt, Joseph tells his brothers, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, for the saving of many lives. Genesis 50, 20. No sense, nonsense. God's love makes sense of your life and mine. Lie number two. There's no future for you. 
you may think you're one of God's favourites, but how do you actually know? What if he doesn't want you in heaven? What if you simply don't count in his grand scheme? The great mudslinger is at it again. For God, verse 29 and 30, for God knew his people in advance. This is the New Living Translation. And he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself, justified them. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. Now, I'm not going to try and explain predestination. God's foreknowledge of the elect. But on its simple, at its simplest, if we've said yes to Jesus, then we find that God has already said yes to us. And as we enter into a relationship with Jesus, we find in Scripture that God intended that relationship way back before time began. If you take your car abroad, you need a five-star service plan in case things start going wrong, a plan which will help you when you break down, take the car to be mended, and get you and the car safely home again. Well, God has a five-star plan for every believer. Firstly, he knew me in advance. The relationship was there from the beginning. Secondly, he chose me to be like Jesus. He put his thumbprint on each one of us. Then, he called me to come to him in all sorts of different ways. Then he made me right with himself as the cross worked its magic of forgiveness in our lives. And then he brought me to glory. And notice that the last hasn't happened yet, but it's as though God has already accomplished it. God's plan includes you and me. It isn't down to us to make it work, and it's the devil's own lie to suggest that we're not part of the plan or that God isn't big enough to complete the program. Lie number three. No answer to prayer. In that case, says the mudslinger, if he's got this great plan for you, he should be answering all your prayers, which he isn't if things are going wrong, like you know they are. He's so persistent, isn't he? All, the, all this is Garden of Eden stuff. Why doesn't God allow you to eat that nice, juicy, fruity titbit? Well, verses 31 and 32. Nothing can stop Paul, can he? He's, he's in full flow. What can we say about wonderful things like these? If God is for us, who can be, ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? The lie is that God may make all these big promises, 
but he's so mean that he keeps us on short rations and keeps the store cupboard locked. I remember my first teaching job. I was brought in for a few weeks to cover someone's absence. It was a Miss Simpson who'd fallen off her bike. And the biggest boy in the class said, Ma Simpson always used to give us sweets, and they're there in your desk. So I looked at the desk, and I said, but it's padlocked, and I haven't got the key, thinking that would clinch the matter. Oh, no, said the boy triumphantly. I can open it, and he produced a massive screwdriver. <laughs> <laughs> well, I forget how I dealt with it, but they didn't get their sweets. Well, the devil's lie is that God's got this enormous store cupboard of blessings, but he keeps it firmly locked. Paul says, look, God gave us his son to die for us. He's not going to turn around and say, well, I've given you my son, but really you've gone too far in asking me for lots of other things, and I'm going to draw the line there. Well, people say, and a prayer isn't about asking God for things and presenting him with a long shopping list. Of course, prayer's about worship and silence and thanksgiving and adoration and praise. But it's also about, about asking, isn't it? If, we, if we're up against it, like David in Psalm 18 that we've read together, aren't we allowed to cry to God for help? Of course we are. So the promise is if God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also, with him, give us everything else? Here are you, and you've been praying for that mem member of the family, or that next door neighbor, or someone, you've been praying for years, and nothing's happened. So is God listening? Well, he heard the first prayer you uttered, and he's gone on hearing them. He's heard everyone since. Sorry. Well, let's get on to the fourth lie. Lie number four. There's no entry to heaven. You're a fraud. Your life is a mess. How dare you call yourself a Christian? You've no right to enter the kingdom of heaven. Verses 33 and 34. Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. He's justified us. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life again for us. And he's sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. The devil's lie is, like all good lies, almost spot on. I'm sure I've told this story before, but here's a man who dies, and he arrives at the pearly gates, and he's interrogated by St. Peter. And he's told, you need a hundred points to get into heaven. What have you done for Christ to earn some points? Well, I've preached a few sermons, I've sung in the church choir, and I've sat on diocesan synod. That's worth one point. <laughs> oh, well, I've been a good husband and father and grandfather, 
and they said nice things about me at my funeral. <laughs> Two points. Wow. Well, I visited an old lady regularly and I fed her cat when she was ill. Worth another point. Hey, at this rate, it's only by the grace of God I'll get into heaven. <laughs> Come on in then! <laughs> When we start justifying ourselves, that is finding good things about ourselves in order to score points with God, we lose the plot. We become exactly like the Pharisees to whom Jesus said, you justify yourselves in the sight of others, but God knows your hearts. Luke 16:15. When the devil points at all the wrong things in your lives, we point to Christ on the cross. And, says Paul here, not only on the cross, but rising from the dead, ascending into heaven, and sitting on God's right hand, where he is at this very moment, interceding and pleading and praying for us and with us. It doesn't depend on us. It depends completely and utterly on what Christ has done for us and is doing for us. We have every right to call ourselves Christians because Christ has called us his own. Fifth and last lie. There's no victory in the war. Sorry, but you're on the losing side. Jesus may love you to bits, but he's not going to win. The church is a club for losers. Verses 35 to 37. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us? If we have trouble or calamity, or are persecuted, or hungry, or destitute, or in danger, or threatened with death, as scriptures say, for your sake we're killed every day. We're being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Now, this list of awful things may sound a bit dramatic, not the run of everyday life, but it's what Paul and his friends experienced on a daily basis, and for that matter, there are plenty of Christians in the world, including those, of course, from Ukraine at this time, who could tick every box on that list. You just have to Google Christian persecutions to find places where Christians face legal disqualification, loss of social acceptance, barriers to education, or direct physical and psychological violence. Some, sadly, have found their faith disintegrating under the strain. But it's also undeniably true that those who've suffered most for Christ tend to include those who are most positive about their love for God and his love for them. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Five muddy dollops of lies. And then Paul comes up with one single reality, that nothing can separate us from God's love. Paul's final outburst in Romans 8 isn't really to answer another lie, it's to summarize all he's been saying in a great outpouring of praise and affirmation. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. 
neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Paul looks so-called reality in the face. He scrolls down a long list of 10 things that could shake our faith, faith to pieces. Death, which we tend to see as the worst thing that can happen. Life, which throws all sorts of unpleasant things at us. Angels, by which he may mean disturbing visions. Demons, temptations he feels all too keenly. Fears for today, the everyday cares of life. Worries about tomorrow, anxieties that turn up at two o'clock in the morning. Even the powers of hell, the forces of evil, which he constantly reminds us, are our real enemies, not flesh and blood. Powers in the sky may be a reference to star signs or astrology and what these stars tell us about our fate. Powers in the earth below um, may mean actual earth deities uh, in his time or could be the pull of our lower natures. Nothing in all creation, no created thing or person, however delightful and attractive. All these things could get between us and our Lord and make us think he doesn't love us anymore. Well, says Paul, that's utter rubbish and nonsense. There's one supreme reality, and that is nothing but nothing can separate you and me from God's love. There's just one thing about electric bikes. You've still got to pedal. The power comes from the built-in battery. But if you don't pedal as well, no power gets through. Yes, our God is loving and all-powerful, but we've got to keep trusting him saying yes to his yes. Do you know the old song? The grace of the Lord, like a fathomless sea, sufficient for you, sufficient for me, is tender and gracious and boundless and free, sufficient for every need. Because our God is all-sufficient, omnicapable. One of his names in the Old Testament, occurring nearly 50 times, is El Shaddai. It's a Hebrew name. It's usually translated the Almighty. But it actually means the all-sufficient one. He runs the universe, having produced it in the first place. He gives his creatures life, including human free will. He allows pain and suffering, but that's not the end of the story. He gave us his son to share our human nature and to go to the cross where he took our sins on himself, then to rise again on the third day. His word is faithful and true, and his spirit is still working among us. There is unimaginable glory round the corner. Nothing can separate us from his love. So, through Palm Sunday, through Good Friday, through Easter and beyond, let's keep peddling. Amen.